Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have with me Dr. Nitin Bhatia. Dr. Bhatia is a spine surgeon who is the chief of spine surgery at University of California, Irvine. Dr. Bhatia did his undergraduate training at Stanford. He then went on to Baylor College of Medicine where he completed his MD degree. From there, he did orthopedic surgery training at UCLA. From there, he finished a, a spine fellowship at the University of Miami. Today, he practices complex spine surgery at University of California, Irvine. Good day, Dr. Bhatia. Thank you for having me. Dr. Bhatia, what, what I would like to discuss over the next 20 minutes is uh, the concept of a herniated disc in the neck. I mean, everybody hears the term herniated disc, bulging disc, those sorts of terms. Define for us what that means when it occurs in the neck. Sure. Well, I think first of all, we have to figure out what is the disc. And the disc is the shock absorbing unit of the spine. So the spine, spinal column and the vertebral column as we call it, is made up of the bones or the vertebral bodies. In between the bodies, which are cylinders of bone, is a disc. So it goes bone, disc, bone, disc. And those discs allow the bones to move and allow them to uh, uh, have impact. And those discs absorb that impact. The discs themselves uh, are made up of two kinds of structures. The outside, or annulus, is actually a very tough outer covering. It's almost like a cloth-like covering. And the inside is a jelly, and we call that the nucleus pulposus. It's, um, I always use food references because I'm always hungry when I'm working. So it's kind of like a jelly donut. It's a firm outside with a jelly-like inside. And you can imagine if you took a jelly donut, you could kind of roll it around, put some impact on it. That's the exact function of the discs. Now, if you took that same jelly donut or disc and squeezed it a little too hard, some of that jelly may rupture out or bulge out of the side. And that's the herniated disc part. It's when some of that jelly from the inside bulges out of the disc because of an abnormal pressure user that was put on the disc. Now, now, how does that occur? I mean, is this, is this usually associated with an injury? Is this something that just occurs? How does, how does a herniated disc, how does it get to be herniated? You know, although we typically talk about it being associated with an injury, either a car accident or lifting a heavy suitcase or a box, most patients say they don't know what started it. They just woke up one morning and boom, their neck was hurting and usually their, one of their arms was burning or on fire or felt like it was had a searing pain in it. So usually patients don't know a, of a specific trauma that caused it, um, but there's probably, if we looked really closely, some abnormal motion that would cause the, the, the disc to herniate or bulge. Now, now there's, there's all sorts of other discussions about neck pain, and some people just have neck pain. Right. Um, and, and sometimes we tell people, well, that's because of degenerative disc disease or it's because of degenerative arthritis. And then there's this whole concept of whiplash, mm -hmm. you know, patients being in a car wreck having whiplash. What's the difference between all these things? That's a, that's a great question. And that's actually a really tough question because these are all kind of different ends of a spectrum of neck problems. So a herniated disc, when we really talk about it, it's that ruptured jelly or ruptured nucleus pulposus or nucleus that's usually pushing on then a nerve and causing pain shooting down the arm. Okay. The uh, notion of, of neck pain or, or pain in the back of the neck, for example, that's usually caused by one of two things, either arthritic type changes, which we call degenerative disc disease. Now in degenerative disc disease, the discs do bulge a little, but instead of having one spot where the jelly pop pops out, the whole disc kind of bulges out because it collapses down a little and tends to bulge. And that's the degeneration. That just happens with everybody with time. In fact, if you obtain an MRI scan on 100 people who had no neck problems, probably the majority of them will have some abnormalities like that seen on an MRI scan. So a bulge disc and a herniated disc, in your mind, is two different things. They're slightly different, correct. And, and whiplash. So, so we've heard about whiplash. Is whiplash a herniated disc? Does whiplash cause a herniated disc, or are these two separate concepts altogether? They're two separate concepts altogether. So a whiplash is more of a muscle injury in the neck. You know, and classically, we talk about the car accident hit from behind, and the neck snaps forward and back, and the muscles get spasmed, and that's the whiplash type injury. So that's more of a soft tissue injury that does not necessarily involve the disc at all. Exactly. Okay. And then I guess the final concept to help people distinguish or help 
help understand the difference, the whole concept of arthritis in the neck as it relates to a herniated disc. Again, are these two different concepts or are they related? They're two different concepts. Everybody gradually gets some arthritis in the neck. And for most people, it doesn't cause any problems. For some people, it causes some pain in the neck. But a herniated disc tends to occur usually at a somewhat younger age, people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. And usually that occurs suddenly, so it's not a degenerative progressive problem like arthritis. And it usually affects one level of the neck versus more uh, of the levels of the neck like arthritis would. So let's define the ideal patient or the common presentation, I guess, for, for a person who has a herniated disc. Um, define that patient for me. Probably the classic person who has a herniated disc is someone in their 30s or 40s who probably had just occasional or even no neck problems, who all of a sudden has an onset of, of some neck pain with pain shooting down one of their arms. They may also have numbness, tingling, or weakness in the, that arm as well. So if I have those symptoms and, I, and I'm wondering what I should do, um, what's my first step? I mean, do I go to the emergency room? Is this a dangerous thing? Should I go make an appointment with my regular primary care physician? Or do I go straight to the, to the spine surgeon? A lot of it depends on how severe the problem is. If it's just a little numbness and tingling and it's not too bad, I'd probably say start with your regular doctor, get a checkup. They'll usually start a treatment of conservative therapy, such as anti-inflammatory medications, uh, physical therapy, maybe a little traction, some, some of these mild treatments to try to get you better. If it's worse and if the pain's now becoming more severe or especially if there's any weakness or it's getting worse, then definitely an evaluation by a spine surgeon is necessary. How, how do you make this diagnosis? I mean, if, if I present to my doctor, whether it's my primary care physician, the emergency room or a spine surgeon, how typically do these physicians make the diagnosis of a herniated disc? Usually it starts off, the majority of the diagnosis is made um, even without any sort of testing. So we, when the patient comes and says, you know, doc, all of a sudden my shoulder and arm started burning, it's going all the way down to my fingertips and I feel a little weak in the arm, that's a pretty clear diagnosis of a herniated disc already just on that. And so the history portion of it or the story of what's happened is really important then on physical examination, we can check for weakness or problems in the reflexes or see if the nerves are irritated in the area where we think they are. And then finally, we use the, the diagnostic tests, like an x-ray and especially an MRI scan to confirm the diagnosis that we thought it was. Okay. And is that usually the, 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 the best test to get is the... Um, the MRI scan, is that what you typically use to sort of say that's, that's what we've got? Right. It is. And an x-ray is great for looking at the bones, but it doesn't show us the, the things that are soft. So it doesn't show us the discs or the nerves. And an MRI scan fills in those gaps. It shows us the discs. It shows us the nerves. And we can actually see the herniated disc pushing on the nerves on the MRI scan. Now, do you feel that there's any need for any other testing? I mean, if it, that pretty much fits, and you're convinced that this is a herniated disc. Is there any other testing that you would recommend patients go through before you begin treatment on that patient? Usually, if it's, if it's pretty clear on the history, physical, and MRI, that's about all the testing we need. Some people come in and it's either it's, a, it's, a, it's not quite an exact position we would think it would be in or the disc is smaller than we thought it would be. There's something that doesn't quite fit, in which case I think more diagnostic testing is necessary. So we can do tests like an EMG, which is, which is a uh, muscle and nerve test to see if the muscles and nerves are irritated, mm -hmm. or a specialized CAT scan to get a better look at the nerve. You know, one thing that we probably should mention, and, and because you're an orthopedic surgeon as well as a spine surgeon, I think you'll have a, a, a specific interest in this, and that is some patients come in with just shoulder pain. That's right. And there's always this classic trap with the patient with a herniated disc who comes in and presents with shoulder pain we spend the first three visits thinking they've got a shoulder problem. Right. And we don't think sometimes that maybe this is a ridiculous pain. So I think one of the things that, that always ought to be kept in mind is that sometimes these herniated discs, they pinch the nerve, and we get pain down in the arm somewhere, but there's no neck pain. Right. So, so you all of a sudden say, well. It's very common, in fact. A lot of patients come in and I tell them, you know, the problem is you have a disc herniation in, in, in your neck, and they look at me. Say, but my neck doesn't hurt. Right. My neck feels fine. And uh, only after you see the picture and, and explain how that 
pressure on a nerve in the neck causes pain down here or up here, do, uh, do we all get on the same page that it's actually being caused by the neck that's otherwise not painful? Well, now that we've made the diagnosis and we know that this person, this patient, has a herniated disc in their neck, what are our treatment options? Well, the options start with conservative treatments, which is always the first line of option that we try. Uh, first line of treatment that we try. So anti-inflammatory medications, sometimes even a light dose of oral steroids, um, physical therapy. If those don't work or the pain is significant enough where those aren't going to help, we can try an injection around the irritated nerve. Normally, it's usually one level of disc that's herniated, pushing on one particular nerve. So we can inject a little steroid, and this is called an epidural steroid injection. Some spine surgeons do them, and sometimes uh, and in my practice, our pain management physicians do them. Um, and that can really help alleviate the pain. Now, it's not always a permanent relief because it doesn't actually fix the disc herniation. All it does is kind of put a Band-Aid over the problem while the body tries to fix it. The good news about disc herniations is that if they happen all of a sudden, the body can try to fix it. And 90% of them will get better on their own within about three months from the time they've started. So we're trying to buy them some time with exactly. all of these conservative treatments. You know, there's a few conservative treatments that patients always ask me about. Uh, one's chiropractic. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody wants to know, will chiropractic hurt or help this? Um, what are your thoughts on that? I think chiropractic treatment is great. The one time I don't like chiropractic treatment is when I know that there's pressure on the nerves. Because I think then, especially manipulations, will cause extra sudden pressure and probably cause more irritation of the nerves. But I think for especially chronic spine problems, chiropractic treatment can be a great um, adjunct treatment for a lot of patients. But in this, in this specific case, instance, I would probably no. avoid it. Um, the other piece is, is the physical therapy. You know, we send patients to physical therapy and um, the physical therapists do lots of things. Uh, they, they do what we call modalities, which are, you know, massage, uh, the TENS unit, neurostem, uh, ultrasound, heat packs, all sorts of things to try to reduce the pain. One of the things that I've found useful, and I, I would like your opinion on it, and that is the cervical traction. You know, mm -hmm. That's become very popular. And s with some of these pinched nerves, I find that the cervical traction that they use works fairly well. I agree. And, and uh, I think for these patients, as I mentioned, one of the things that we're really looking for is is kind of temporary relief while the body tries to fix its disc herniation on its own. And so the modalities, ultrasound, iontophoresis, TENS, all these things can really help, as well as cervical traction. Cervical traction is also nice because you can buy a very inexpensive home traction device where that adds a little pressure to the neck, and the patient can do it on their own at home mm -hmm. on a daily basis. And it takes just a little pressure off of that nerve and maybe causes some relief. Do you have any, any opinion on medication treatment for this? I mean, you mentioned anti-inflammatories. Obviously, there's some other medications that we use for these acute pain. One's narcotics, just right. pain pills. And the other are the newer nerve pain medications um, that we use. They used to be seizure medications, but right. there's a whole raft of them that we use to try to calm down nerve pain, especially this pain going into the arm. What's your feeling on, one, let's talk about narcotics a little bit, and its use for cervical radiculopathy from a herniated disc, and then these other medications that we sometimes use with them. Sure. What are your thoughts? Well, honestly, I'm not a huge fan of the narcotics for, for pain in the acute setting. Um, if someone comes in in real pain, we have to get the pain under control. And in that case, narcotics are great. But the worry with narcotics for myself and any practitioner and patient is how addictive are they? Mm -hmm. And what we don't want to do is put someone on really high-dose narcotics all of a sudden um, make them drowsy enough where they can't function in their regular life and just mask a problem that's ongoing and let it go on for months and months and months. I do think we need to take the edge off and so narcotics provide that excellent role. So a temporary I think use. it's Exactly. Um, and then the nerve stabilizing agents as I call them that, which uh, you alluded to they used to be seizure medications and the two main ones are, are gabapentin which is also called Neurontin and a new one called Lyrica which I think work wonderfully for temporary pain relief for nerves that are irritated, mm -hmm. uh, both in the arms and the legs. Once you get to the point that, you know, maybe this has gone on for three months, and we're not, we're not seeing any resolution, it may have improved a little bit, may not have, still having a lot of problems. What drives you to make the decision as to when surgery 
is necessary. Well, I think you, you've hit on a lot of the reasons why surgery may be necessary already. Um, one of the patient groups who may need surgery are people who we've tried these things on, who, who have pain but don't have any weakness, and we've tried the anti-inflammatories and the nerve medicines and the injections, and they just haven't gotten any better, and they're still miserable. The other group of patients who really need surgery, maybe a little more, more quickly, are people who come in and, they, and they're in so much pain that they just aren't, can't function. They have so much pain, they can't go to work, they can't move their arm because it hurts so much. And then the group of patients who come in, and they're, they're not only in pain, but they have weakness in the arm. And that's very worrisome, because when you have weakness, the longer you have it, probably uh, the more likely it'll become permanent. And so for most patients who fortunately fall in that first category, where it's just pain, but it, and it's bad, but it's not debilitating, we try all the other treatments, and if they don't work, and it's been two or three months, then we're probably looking at surgery. And then for people whose pain is really bad or who have weakness, it's probably sur surgery sooner rather than later to get the pressure off of the nerves and allow the nerves to heal and recover faster and get the patient back to life and work and all the other things they want to be doing as quickly as possible. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the options for surgery for a herniated disc. Sure. I mean, is this a, a condition that has a tried and true sort of method for fixing this? Have we settled on one thing to fix this? Or, are, or do we have multiple surgical options? Well, I think like most things in medicine, there are multiple options. But I think there's probably one that most surgeons would, would agree on is probably the gold standard or the one that most people use. And that's in what we call an anterior cervical discectomy, where we come in from the front of the neck or anterior, go in and take out the disc that's herniated, and then we reconstruct where we've taken the disc out with what we call a fusion. So the whole procedure is an anterior cervical discectomy infusion. Mm. And it works absolutely wonderfully. It's essentially outpatient surgery now. So if you have surgery in the morning, you can go home in the evening or usually the next morning. Um, as soon as you wake up from surgery, the pain's essentially all gone. And the recovery is very rapid. There's very minimal postoperative discomfort and extremely, extremely low complication rate. Well, you mentioned that it was it was very successful, like 100 percent. It's probably not quite 100 percent, but it's in the probably mid 90s, maybe even higher than that, high 90s. And when patients. it fails, what what normally happens that it doesn't work? Usually, it's it's one of two things. Number one, uh, part of the surgery involves what we call a fusion, where we have to take the disc out, we have to reconstruct it. And in some patients. Uh, it might not heal correctly. And certain patients are a little higher risk of that, people who smoke, people with diabetes, um, just because the blood flow to that area isn't quite as good, so they have a little higher rate of non-healing of that fusion. Um, some patients, even though we go in and clean out the nerves and do everything right, the nerves may have sustained some permanent damage, so they may have some residual nerve problems afterwards. And I think what you said before is that the longer you wait, the more likely that is to occur. Exactly. So that's one reason for doing it, maybe if it's not getting better, sooner rather than later. Exactly. Um, you would mentioned reconstructing and doing the fusion. So if, if I can paraphrase what this procedure involves, it, it is going in, taking out the disc first. So going in with the microscope, getting that fragment off the nerve. Getting, and you, to do that, you have to go through the disc, so you have to destroy the disc. Exactly. And then putting a bone graft in there. In the old days, we just put a bone graft in there. Right. Nowadays, most people use a plate. Is that your preference, is to use a metal plate? It is, and the metal plate is advantageous for a few reasons. Number one, it allows us to get the patients out of any sort of neck collar more rapidly. Um, it allows us to get them moving and back to work and back to life more rapidly. Um, and it also increases the rates of fusion and decreases some of the other complications um, that you may have if you don't use a plate. Mm -hmm. Now, do you ever recommend taking that plate out? No, usually not. Occasionally, patients may have some discomfort from the plate, um, but it's quite rare. So, in general, I say just leave it alone if it's not bothering you. And you had mentioned people get back to work very quickly after yep. this. Um, give me the normal scenario um, about, you know, if you have, if you have a discectomy infusion tomorrow, how long to your whale till you forget about this happening to you? Most people, you're up walking the same day of surgery, uh, eating like normal, it's essentially the same day, home within 24 hours, uh, usually within seven days, uh, feeling really good. Um, 
people who work at a desk job can be back to work in two weeks, maybe three weeks, uh, maybe even sooner than that. Uh, my, if I operate on, a, say, someone who's a computer programmer, they're usually working from home within a week on their computer. Uh, the professional athletes I take care of, you, I usually hold them out of professional sports for six weeks, especially contact sports. Um, but once uh, that time period's up, you can usually get back to doing 100% of the activities you want to do. Okay. Well, it sounds like a very successful procedure for, for a, a fairly common problem. Um, again, one of those things that nobody likes to talk about, but what are the risks of this procedure? I mean, what are the risks to me as a patient if I'm going to have this surgery? Fortunately, the risks are very small. Um, the risks uh, involve bleeding, you lose a few drops of blood, maybe a tablespoon at most. So the risk of a transfusion is extremely low. One of the risks that people always worry about is, is risk to the spinal cord or nerves. Am I, uh, are they going to wake up paralyzed or with a weak arm? Um, and we use an operating microscope to really see everything beautifully. We use a, a spinal cord monitor that checks the nerves throughout the surgery so we can tell if anything's wrong. Um, and then fundamentally important is experience for the surgeon. The surgeon who's only does spine surgery, who has lots of experience in, in neck surgery, is really critical to a good outcome. Um, there are some small risks with the approach through the front of the neck. So your throat may be sore for a few days and voice may be hoarse for a few days, but that's usually transient. It gets better. Besides that, those are really the only risks. Okay. And, and you know, obviously people are always worried about they're operating on my neck. Could I be right. paralyzed? I mean, how realistic is that it, really? It's, it's, it, it, it does happen, but extremely, extremely rarely. Um, knock on wood, I've never had in any in my practice ever. Um, but if you look around the country, the risk is probably between 1 in 2,000 and 1 in 5,000, if that high. Um, and that's why, you know, you... You go to a surgeon who uses spinal cord monitoring, uses a microscope, uh, and who has lots of experience doing these kinds of surgeries to diminish those risks as low as possible. Okay. And, and I think from our discussion today, this is a very common thing. So people should not be too, uh, con I mean, everybody's concerned when they have to have surgery. There's a joke that, you know, the definition of minor surgery is surgery on somebody else. Right. But I, I think that, that this is a very common thing that is done every day in this country and is, is, is relatively well tolerated by patients. Exactly. It's probably the second uh, most common surgery we do in America. It's extremely well tolerated. Uh, if you asked spine surgeons, you know, name one or two of the surgeries that you would have on yourself, this is probably going to be number one or two on anybody's list. Great. Um, any last minute comments to patients who are faced with trying to figure this out for themselves if they think they have a herniated disc? Anything we haven't covered today that you would uh, either recommend to patients or caution patients about relating to a herniated disc in the neck? Sure. The, um, you know, the, as I mentioned, the gold standard and the thing that most of us use is the discectomy infusion. Nowadays, there are a few other options that are available. One involves a discectomy and then a disc replacement, which is an interesting new option for patients. Um, the long-term studies are still coming up, but so far things look very good, and that's uh, becoming a bigger and bigger part of my practice. Um, it's usually only good for people with disc herniations at one level. Um, the other, one other option is a small procedure through the back of the neck where we just open up the area for the nerve, but some of the results aren't quite as good as doing it through the front of the neck. It's not quite as high a percentage rate of success. Overall, what the patients want to do is make sure that they or seeing a spine surgeon who has lots of experience in this, that they're seeing a fellowship trained spine surgeon who only does um, spine surgery, uh, and that they're very comfortable with the surgeon. If they're not, see, see another surgeon, get a second opinion, um, make sure you're happy with uh, that surgeon's credentials and your relationship with them. But it really is a, a wonderful surgery if you do need one um, with great results and very rapid recovery. So in the future, we may be seeing more artificial disc replacements to treat this problem and maybe a shift from the, the, the tried and true anterior cervical discectomy infusion into um, the artificial disc. I think you will. I think in the neck, you will see more and more artificial discs being used. But at this point in time, you would not tell a patient that that's preferable, that if somebody has said, anterior cervical discectomy infusion is what you need, that's a pretty legitimate... It's very... That's still the gold standard. And in fact, when we say that the disc replacements are successful, it's because we're comparing them 
to the fusions, and we know the fusions work so well, and it looks like, at least in the short term, that the disc replacements have comparable results. The big question is what's going to happen 10 and 15 years down the road? Well, thanks. My uh, pleasure. Very good information for pa people and patients faced with uh, uh, understanding uh, a herniated disc in the neck, and I think that's good information. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks for watching today. If you have questions about the topic that we discussed today or any orthopedic topic, be sure to visit eorthopod.com. And if you're an orthopedic surgeon or healthcare provider interested in participating as a guest on eorthopod TV, you'll also find instructions on how to apply to become a guest on eorthopod TV. Thanks for watching.